Thanks for tuning in. Ham Talk Live will be on the air shortly. Please stand by. Thanks for tuning in. Ham Talk Live will be on the air shortly. Please stand by. Good evening, everyone. This is Ham Talk Live, episode number six, National Voice of America Museum of Broadcasting, recorded live on Thursday, March 24th, 2016. I'm your host, Neil Rapp, WB9VPG. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Ham Talk Live. Tonight on the show, Gary West, K8DEV, Jay Adrick, K8CJY, and Joe Gruber, WD8AZQ, will join us. Our guests tonight are from the National Voice of America Museum of Broadcasting and the Westchester Amateur Radio Association. They will be talking about the Voice of America Museum in Westchester, Ohio, and their club station inside the museum, WC8VOA. And there's a special opportunity for hams to get a special tour of the facility, and you don't want to miss the information on that. So stay tuned for that, and we'll take your calls live in just a few minutes. Last week on the big show, Bob Alfin, K4UEE, was here to talk about the big time D expeditions that he's organized. And if you missed that show or any future show, you can listen to the replay on HamTalkLive.com or on Spreaker, TuneIn, iTunes, SoundCloud, or YouTube. And last week we added Stitcher. Uh, we also added Google Play, although Google Play is not ready for listeners just yet, but we'll be on there as soon as they're ready to go. And hopefully will be added to iHeart Podcasts as well in the, in the next week or so. Uh, tonight we want to take your calls as always, so in just a few minutes be ready to call in. You can call us on Skype. Uh, just use the audio only feature on Skype. And the username there is Ham Talk Live, Or you can call us by telephone. It's 812-NET-AM-1. That's 812 638 Four two six one. My guests this evening are from the National Voice of America Museum of Broadcasting and the Westchester Amateur Radio Association. Gary West, K8DEV, was born and grew up in rural Ohio and came to Cincinnati in 1964 to attend the University of Cincinnati, where he graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Industrial Management. Gary and his wife, Dee Dee, have been married for 48 years and have lived in the Cincinnati area that entire time, most recently in Westchester. Gary is a semi-retired co-owner of GW Associates, consultants, packaging brokers, and manufacturers' representatives. During his career, he held various management positions at the Kroger Company and was also employed at Procter & Gamble, WONE Radio, and WUBE Radio. Gary is currently serving on the board of the National Voice of America Museum of Broadcasting and also the Gray History of Wireless Museum. Gary is an advanced class amateur radio operator and was licensed in 1961. Joe Gruber, WD8AZQ, has been a ham since 1975. Joe's career spans 37 years in the semiconductor industry, most of it with Intel Corporation. Joe was involved in many strategic roles at Intel but had the most fun as an evangelist for Emerging Technologies. Joe retired from Intel last year and holds patents in telephony and in security. Uh, today, Joe is a partner in several web startup businesses, and he's on the board at VOA where he manages the STEM Outreach Program and is an associate judge for the IADAS Webby Awards. Jay Adrick, our final guest, is K8CJY, and he's been active in amateur radio since 1961. He's a 51-plus year veteran of the broadcast industry. In 2013, Jay retired from Harris Corporation as their vice president of broadcast technology, 
but continues as an industry consultant specializing in digital television systems, television spectrum issues, and the upcoming television spectrum repack. He was awarded the Television Engineering Achievement Award by the NAB, is a fellow of the Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers, and the IEEE Broadcast Television Society, and SBE, the Society of Broadcast Engineers. Jay serves as a board member on the Voice of America National Museum of Broadcasting. So thank you all for Join us in joining us this evening on Ham Talk Live. Thanks. Well, glad to be here. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, Neil. Well, uh, we've got uh, a lot of uh, ground to cover here this evening. Um, first of all, uh, Jay, if you would tell us a little bit about the history of the Voice of America facility there, uh, the Bethany Shortwave Relay Station near uh, Westchester. And tell us a little bit about when that was built and, and why it's there and um, who got this all started. Okay, very good. Well, the um, station was uh, a result, direct result, of our entry into World War II. At the time the war began, Germany and Japan were very active with propaganda radio uh, broadcasting uh, to various parts of the world. Uh, Germany in particular was focusing on Latin America. And um, they had many shortwave transmitters of fairly high power up in the 100 kilowatt range. Um, whereas in the United States, we only had 13 shortwave transmitters that were uh, in broadcast service. And uh, the highest powered one was 75 kilowatts. And it was located uh, at Mason, Ohio, with the call letters WLWO. As soon as the war started, the government um, commandeered all 13 of those transmitters uh, at uh, a, about 10 sites around the, uh, the U.S. and uh, began uh, some broadcasting under an organization that was quickly set up called the Office of War Information, OWI. In February of 1942, a meeting was called in Washington, and they brought in representatives from uh, several of the major equipment manufacturing firms like RCA, Westinghouse, General Electric. But they also brought in representatives from NBC, CBS, and Crosley Broadcasting. Now, some people would say, well, why Crosley? Well, Crosley, since 1934, had been broadcasting with 500 kilowatts on medium wave at WLW with the transmitter located out at Mason. And uh, they also had been active in the shortwave business since 1926, but became seriously engaged in shortwave with WLWO beginning in uh, 1939. Um, so uh, the person that represented Crosley was James D. Schaus. He was the president of Crosley Broadcasting, uh, working for Powell Crosley, and uh, he went to Washington uh, they talked about the needs and the fact that they really wanted high power. 200 kilowatts was their goal uh, for each transmitter, and uh, it ne had never been done. The, the, the tubes didn't exist. The technology really didn't exist. Um, so Schaus called back to uh, a gentleman by the name of Ronald J. Rockwell, R.J. Rockwell. Uh, Jim was, um, by the way, ham, K-8-R-R -R was his call. And uh, he said Jim was the director of engineering for Crosley Broadcasting. And he, he said to, to Jim, uh, you know, this is what they're looking for, 200 kilowatt transmitters. They need six of them uh, at our facility. Uh, if we can do it, um, is that possible? And uh, Jim and it was, was uh, one of these guys that um, never looked down at an opportunity. So his answer was... Um, well, you know, I think we can do it, um, but I'll, I'll give it one hell of a try. And uh, uh, Jim uh, uh, was awarded a contract. I would say he, Crosley Broadcasting, was awarded the contract uh, virtually on the spot in Washington. It was, a, as we're, we're told, a one-page contract, uh, pretty much a blank check, um, initial authorization of a million dollars. And they came back. Uh, they found the land consisting of three farms, um, basically one square mile of land down the road from WLW's transmitter. That was quickly acquired by the government. Um, the land was cleared. 
and uh, Rockwell uh, pulled together the Crosley engineers, a very talented bunch of, of uh, radio engineers, and also hired a group of uh, University of Cincinnati engineering co-ops. Um, he um, started researching, found out that um, there were no tubes that could do that kind of power at short wave. Uh, so they engaged um, uh, the uh, federal IT&T company to start developing tubes. He developed a transmitter design with his crew, and they designed a building to house the transmitters, uh, a total of six of them. The um, construction was started in uh, 1943. Uh, the antennas were designed around a rhombic uh, type of antenna design uh, with um, a whole group of them aimed at different locations starting at northern Europe, going all the way through southern Europe and into Africa and also Latin America. Um, the antennas were put together by Cincinnati Gas and Electric Company and Dayton White Heat and Power, two utility companies where they spliced uh, power poles together, and uh, they did all the stringing of the copper. Uh, the transmitters were started in a machine shop quickly set up in an old candy factory down on Central Parkway in Cincinnati uh, while the building was being built. It was in early 1944 that they started moving transmitters into the facility, and by uh, late June of 44, they had one transmitter on the air, by September, September the 23rd, which was the formal dedication of the facility, they had uh, all six transmitters up and running, and they were broadcasting with programming that came from New York from the Office of War Information. The government had hired a group of professional broadcasters and set up studios in New York to, um, to broadcast uh, the, uh, the message. So <clears throat> that's how it came about, and of course the location because of Crosley and the expertise at high power with the 500 kilowatts on WLW. It's uh, quite an interesting story, a lot of details. The transmitters um, were, uh, I guess you could say, homebrewed by uh, a group. Uh, many of, of the uh, engineers were hams, and um, <clears throat> they were pretty much built there in the uh, candy factory and then later uh, finished up there on site in the, the building. Um, the facility remained, remained pretty much intact um, until the early 60s when there was a major renovation that was done and three of the transmitters, the Crosley transmitters, were removed and replaced with Collins 250-kilowatt uh, transmitters. Um, <clears throat> so it was... Um, uh, an interesting place to work. Uh, they um, were on the air almost 24-7. Uh, they had a couple of down hours uh, overnight uh, when they uh, uh, retuned the transmitters and uh, came up on different frequencies. Um, by the way, the, the, the transmitters that were used were actually a master and a slave. So they had one power supply, one modulator driving two RF decks and uh, they broadcast with frequency diversity, uh, two different frequencies, same programming. Um, and later, uh, in 61, three of those transmitters, the slaves were removed and replaced with these Collins transmitters. Now, so that's, I, uh, that's a bit of the background, uh, Neil. Yeah, I've got a clip here of one of the, the first broadcasts that, uh, that was sent out. And I apologize, you won't be able to hear it over Skype. I didn't mention that to you before the show, but... Uh, we're going to listen to uh, a little clip here of one of the first uh, transmissions to come out of uh, the Voice of America. Hier spricht eine Stimme aus Amerika, aus Amerika im Krieg. Unsere Stimmen kommen zu Ihnen aus New York. This über is a voice Ostern. speaking from America. A voice from America at war. Our voices are coming to you from New York, across the Atlantic Ocean to London from where they are relayed to you in Germany. Today, America has been at war for 79 days. Daily at this time, we shall speak to you about America and the war. 
The news may be good or bad. We shall tell you the truth. So the idea was that we were going to provide the truth. Absolutely. Um, that was what was insisted upon by the, uh, the people that were hired. Uh, originally, it was thought that this would be a propaganda source, but um, they quickly put that to rest. And, of course, the, uh, uh, the truth was given whether it was good uh, or bad. Uh, and it served a very important role uh, during the war. Um, and then the role kind of shifted after the, uh, uh, the end of the war. Yeah, we're, we're just about up to our uh, first break here. But uh, mention just real quickly about what the role of uh, Voice of America was after the war. So the Voice of America, um, the Office of War Information, of course, was the job was over when the war was over. But as you know, we soon had a Cold War, and um, so the operation was transferred over to the State Department and became uh, a part of uh, what became the known as the Voice of America. The Voice of America was uh, both a broadcasting arm as well as a um, an information uh, arm, and eventually that became, by the way, known as the USIA, the U.S. Information Agency. So uh, they provided a lot of um, uh, truth and information to uh, people behind the Iron Curtain um, and in countries where uh, oppression during the Cold War was taking place. And uh, we've had many, many visitors who have come to the uh, facility uh, who are people that immigrated to the United States, and uh, they have talked about, you know, how how great it was to be able to receive the Voice of America and find out the truth. Uh, there's a great, great clip uh, from one of the uh, the fellows from behind the Iron Curtain talking about, uh, you know, in Russia, um, the crops were always good, uh, airplanes never crashed, and he went on and on with a lot of great detail. Uh, but uh, what the point he was trying to make was that um, you, you really didn't hear the truth from the local broadcasters there in uh, in, in Russia, but he got the truth from the voice of America. Now, Joe, um, if you can answer this for us, um, is, is voice of America still in operation? Obviously the, the, the facility there is not operating anymore. Um, so is that still going? And if so, how are they accomplishing that? Thanks, Neil. And, and indeed voice of America still is in operation, but certainly more of a contemporary role today than, uh, existed back in the, in the World War II era, uh, to give you an idea that you know there's a yearly budget of over a little over two hundred million dollars supporting um, over a thousand employees in the Voice of America. They do uh, broadcasting in forty four different languages to an audience of nearly two hundred million people every week. So it's a it's a huge operation that's uh, underway right now. They uh, Voice of America programs are delivered on satellite. And cable and shortwave, um, FM, medium wave. They do streaming audio and video, um, you know, cell phones, uh, you name it. Um, every conceivable uh, opportunity to reach audiences is being used today. And the mantra is still the same. Um, get accurate information out. Stories are verified by um, two independent sources or uh, at least uh, one representative of uh, VOA who actually witnessed the event. So they want to get uh, accurate information. It's a great, um, a great service for the English language for people who want to learn English turn to Voice of America quite frequently. Yeah, so no, the charter... I, I actually have a clip here uh, of a little bit of that. And that was one of the things that fascinated me when I was there was this, uh, they call it special English. It has a limited vocabulary and uh, is spoken a lot slower. So let, let's listen to just a, just a few seconds of, of that. From VOA Learning English, this is the technology report in special English. Researchers are studying how mobile phones can help to document the spread of malaria. The study is part of an effort to stop or at least control the disease which killed an estimated 655,000 people in 2010. 
So you can tell, you know, it's a lot slower, uh, simple words uh, to help people learn English while they're getting the news. Exactly. And, um, you know, that along with uh, trying to get uh, non-tainted information out there as events happen, you know, is still the charter of VOA. You you asked about transmitting facilities. There is still uh, limited transmission coming from uh, our sister facility down in Greenville, North Carolina. It's not fully operational, but there is some transmission. And typically for radio broadcast, they work with a third-party company called the IBB to contract uh, transmission operations around the world strategically as required. And each month, if you go on the website, you'll note that they actually change frequencies to kind of fit the time of year and maximize their uh, penetration and presence in the areas that they, they want to deliver messages. Very good. Well, uh, we need to take a break, uh, but we'll be back with some more about the Voice of America Museum right after this word from one of our sponsors, the Ham Station, right here on Ham Talk Live. This episode of Ham Talk Live is brought to you by The Ham Station. For 35 years, The Ham Station has brought new and used radios, antennas, accessories, and equipment to the amateur radio community. Give Jeff or Dan a call at 1-800-729-4373 or order online at hamstation.com. Ham Station carries all the major brands like Icom, Yaesu, and Kenwood. Shop from a wide selection of radio scanners, MFJ accessories, Heil Sound products, Mirage and Ameritron amplifiers, Cushcraft antennas, and more. Easy online shopping and fast shipping are waiting for you at hamstation.com or call 1 800 729 4373. The Ham Station, proud to sponsor this episode of Ham Talk Live. Hey, baby, what's your sign? What's your call sign? You're listening to Ham Talk Live with Neil Rapp. Welcome back to Ham Talk Live. Thanks to the support of the Ham Station to bring Ham Talk Live to you each week. Dan and Jeff are just a phone call away to answer your questions about a new rig or antenna. Call 800-729-4373. And be sure to listen to the show every Thursday night at 9 p.m. Eastern Time right here on HamTalkLive.com. Also check out our Facebook page and our Twitter feed. Just search for HamTalkLive. We do have some pictures of the Voice of America Museum of Broadcasting in Westchester, Ohio, up there on Facebook and Twitter. Okay, let's go to Gary now. And Gary, tell us how the museum came about. Well, Neil, uh, as most of you know, in November of 1994, VOA Bethany was decommissioned. It had become the victim of changing technology that actually made the facility obsolete. Uh, In 1997, on a very sad day for many of us, all of its towers were brought down and the property was uh, sold to the local community for one dollar. Uh, the federal government sold 25 acres uh, to a private developer, and that became the Voice of America Shopping Center. Miami University received 25 acres for the development of the Regional Learning Center, and uh, Westchester Township and Butler County Metro Parks uh, received nearly 500 acres between them and the historic VOA building. Uh, Westchester Township later awarded its share of the uh, twenty or the 500 acres to Metro Parks of Butler County for the develop of, development of recreational facilities for the community's benefit, but retained the uh, VOA Bethany building and surrounding 20 acres for restoration and development of the National Voice of America Museum of Broadcasting. In 2006, Westchester Township trustees created and appointed a governing board for the museum, About the same time, the township and the state of Ohio invested approximately $2 million in renovating and preserving the outside of the building. Uh, The renovation included replacing the building's facing, new energy-efficient doors and windows, and a new roof. The board was charged with creating and maintaining the National Voice of America Museum of Broadcasting. 
The board's responsibilities include creating a facility that pays homage to the Voice of America's legacy and recognizes VOA's role in promoting freedom and democracy uh, throughout the world and the technology VOA developed to accomplish this goal. The board was also responsible for supervising and coordinating the activities of the three partner organizations that are located at the museum. Those are namely the Westchester Amateur Radio Association, Gray History of Wireless Museum, and uh, Media Heritage. Well, I I had a chance to go there this this summer, uh, this past summer, and uh, got went through the Gray Museum and the uh, Cincinnati Museum of Broadcasting and everything, and it's just just fabulous. And I know you've got a lot more uh, work that you're planning on doing. We'll talk about that uh, in a bit and how uh, maybe some of our listeners can help out with that. But um, it, it's a it's a great facility. So Jay, uh, I understand there's. Uh, several key components that make up that collection. Why don't you run those down for us and and tell our listeners a little bit about what they would see if they're uh, able to come and tour the museum and when they can do that. Okay, very good. Uh, well, yes, there are um, basically four um, four overall components. Um, the gray history of wireless uh, is one of them. A uh, great history of wireless uh, actually began with um, George J. Gray, Jack Gray, who was the first supervisor of the Bethany transmission plant. Uh, Jack worked for um, for many years for the, the Crosley organization and then transferred to the uh, U.S. government uh, when they took over the facility in 1963. Jack, um, in the early 50s, began collecting uh, early wireless equipment. And uh, he uh, had that in a, uh, a building, uh, started out with his garage and then added a, a, a structure to the garage and had that at his home in, in, in Mason, Ohio. And when Jack passed away, um, the collection was handed off to a group of, of hams uh, and for many years resided at the WCET, the public TV station uh, in the Crosley uh, telecommunications center, uh, but uh, was forced out of there as they needed more space. And that became kind of the, the initial cornerstone uh, for the museum. Uh, and then the, the um, of course, collection artifacts and so forth related to the Voice of America itself. And the, uh, the third major museum component is the Cincinnati Media Heritage uh, Collection, that was started by a local broadcaster and former student of mine, uh, uh, Mike Martini. Um, uh, the collection has um, both artifacts and pictures and uh, some great uh, material documenting the history of broadcasting in the greater Cincinnati area. And, of course, this was a, uh, a major broadcast center um, compared to uh, – New York and Los Angeles, Cincinnati was right up there with them uh, because of the uh, the Crosley um, uh, activities uh, in the uh, 30s and 40s. Uh, this was uh, was a real mecca for uh, network broadcasting. So Mike has uh, a lot of that, uh, plus the archives of Fred Ziv, who was a program producer. Uh, the, um, the fourth component of that, of course, is the... Uh, Westchester Amateur Radio Association and WC8VOA, which resides in the uh, the former uh, control room of the original uh, voice uh, facility there at, at Bethany. Now, <clears throat> the collection is open on the third Saturday of every month from 1 to 4 p.m. Uh, our goal as part of the museum is to uh, expand those hours, but we have um, a fair amount of work to do in terms of making the, um, the building ADA compliant and um, some renovation in the uh, museum exhibit space. Uh, Gary will talk a bit more about that uh, later in the show. Uh, we are going to have uh, a special open house, which I, I've hosted uh, every other year um, at the uh, VOA Museum uh, for hams. It used to be on Friday night. This year we're moving it to Saturday night. Uh, during the um, the hamvention, and we'll be open from six thirty until nine o'clock 
with uh, tours and uh, guides to uh, take you through and explain the uh, the collection. Some very unique pieces in the collection. We'll talk about that uh, uh, in a bit as well, uh, Neil. Very good, very good. Well, I'm I'm glad to hear that that uh, that's coming up, and we'll we'll tell you just a little bit uh, more about that here. Uh, after we take one more break, uh, we do need to do that, but we'll be back with more about the Voice of America Museum and a chance for you guys out there listening to uh, to see this place. It's it's fantastic. So uh, we will be back in just about a minute and talk about that right here on Ham Talk Live. This episode of Ham Talk Live is brought to you by Tower Electronics. Tower Electronics has been the Ham's dime store since 1978, bringing connectors, antennas, cables, and other parts to the world. Scott and Jill travel the country bringing their store to you at HamFest, but you can also order online at pl-259.com or by calling 920-435-2973. Stock up on those supplies like PL259 and end connectors, audio cables, mobile antennas, and hamsticks. Their silver-plated end connectors are even in use on the International Space Station. Tower Electronics is a dealer for MFJ, Comet, Daiwa, OPEC, Workman, and HamPro Technologies. Tower Electronics, online at pl-259.com, proud to sponsor this episode of Ham Talk Live. CQ, CQ, CQ. You're listening to Ham Talk Live with Neil Rapp. Welcome back to Ham Talk Live. We'd like to thank Tower Electronics for sponsoring the show. Don't miss Scott and Jill at the Mobile Alabama Ham Fest on April 9th, where you can visit the website at pl-259.com. The National Voice of America Museum of Broadcasting is our topic this evening, and we have some time for some calls. We'll be doing that shortly, so get ready to Skype us at Ham Talk Live, or you can call us by telephone at 812-NET-HAM-1. We do have a couple of things, though, we had hoped to, uh, to squeeze in here, so let's do that. So uh, the big announcement, Joe, tell us everything our listeners need to know about attending this open house on Hamvention weekend. Excellent. And yes, we are having an open house. The when is Saturday, May 21st, 6 30 PM to 9 PM. It is at the voice of America, Bethany relay station. And, um, uh, gosh, what's the easiest way to find it? Um, we have a website, at voamuseum.org, www.voamuseum.org, uh, for further directions on that. It's $5 payable at the door. Uh, we'll have some refreshments there, and we will have some of the most special, coolest tours that we've ever done because we're going to have a lot of hams coming down from Dayton, and we want to show some some of the uh, the inside Uh, secrets, if you will. So we look forward to having as many people join us as possible. Well, that's excellent, Joe. I I got to see, you know, a lot, but I'm sure there'll be a lot more um, available there. And then, um, Gary, tell us a little bit about the the club station there, the WC8VOA. I was able to uh, sit down and operate that for about 30 or 45 minutes that day and had a nice little uh, pile up there. Tell us a little bit about uh, about the operating that station. Okay, Neil. Well, I'd uh, like to let uh, your listeners know that the station is available for operation by anyone who visits the museum. Um, the station is located in the restored original control room for the VOA facility, and it has four operating positions. Three of the stations have amplifiers, including one that has a vintage Henry 2K Classic. The remaining station is a beginner station that operates barefoot and has PSK-31 capabilities. We also have a VHF-UHF operating position and a separate APRS station. Uh, We are currently installing an operating bench for some of our vintage equipment, and we are in the process of setting up a vintage FT-101EE, which was the last FT-101 to come off the uh, Yezu uh, FT-101 service line before they shut it down, and that's going to be the first part of this installation. We hope to have that up and running here shortly. 
Uh, the facility has been undergoing restoration for several years, so that's prevented us from installing any permanent antennas, but we do have two 60-foot temporary towers, one at each end of the building, and uh, both hold tri-band beams. The east tower also has a 75-40 and 17-meter fan dipole, and the west tower has a 6-meter beam and a separate dipole for 75 and 40 meters in addition to the tri-bander. And I know uh, you've got a uh, you've got a repeater me? too. Is the repeater located there, or is it just in the area? Uh, the repeater is actually located over in Fairfield, but that okay. is we will do talk in on that. That's one forty five point three nine minus six hundred, and uh, it, it has no access code. You don't need a tone to get so, into it. Excellent, excellent. Uh, and and it's real easy to find if you take the the, the exit there you you can actually see it from from the highway so it, it's it's not um, hard to find so if you have some questions give us a call uh, we're going to open up the lines here uh, Skype us at Ham Talk Live or call us at eight one two Net Ham One that's eight one two six three eight four two six one if you have a question for any of these guys, Gary, Joe, or Jay, uh, about the museum and about the open house, please give us a call. And um, Gary, why don't you go ahead and tell us about the, the development plans uh, for the museum and, and how people can help out with that. Well, Neil, as uh, you saw when you were there, we've already made some pretty significant progress, but you also saw that we've got a lot of opportunities for the facility uh, we hope to make this a truly first-class operation, and we're going to need a lot of help to accomplish this goal. As I previ previously stated, uh, Westchester Township and the state of Ohio have made some very significant contributions, including renovation of the shell of the building. Uh, members of the Westchester Amateur Radio Association have donated a very substantial amount of labor to accomplish several very significant projects at the museum. Uh, the most recent accomplishment is the development of the West Garage area into Clyde Hanley Hall, a multi-purpose exhibit meeting area. As an aside here, Clyde was a co-op engineer at the VOA uh, station when it was constructed. He later became vice president of engineering for Crosley Broadcasting, which was later known as Avco Broadcasting. Clyde is 93 years old and is currently a member of the museum board. Um, other significant projects include removal of two of the three Collins 250 KW shortwave transmitters and removal of the racking at the north end of the control room for exhibit and meeting space. The club also rebuilt the original control room into what is now the WC8VOA ham shack. Current projects in various stages of development, uh, a few of them are development of the east garage area into a more focused exhibit and meeting area, Expansion of heating and air conditioning systems in the building to areas that are not currently heated or air conditioned. Modifications to the building to make it more handicap accessible. Uh, modernization of restroom facilities. Development of exhibit areas to more effectively tell the VOA story and of special interest to us hams. Installation of permanent antennas for WC8 VOA and replica uh, rhombic and curtain antennas that WC8 VOA will use to demonstrate the operation of the original VOA antennas. We have numerous other things that we want to accomplish, and we are looking for money, in-kind donations, and volunteers who can help us with these projects. Anyone seeking more information about these opportunities can contact us through our website, voamuseum.org. That's voamuseum.org. More information about the Westchester Amateur Radio Association is available at wc8voa.org. That's Whiskey Charlie 8 Victor Oscar Alpha.org. Or anyone who would like to reach me uh, directly can do so at k8dev, kilo8 delta echo victor at yahoo.com. So that's a little bit of what we're up to. Well, very good. And I know the day that I was there, the, the, the garage door was half open so we could get some air in there. And I was glad that it was a, a cold, rainy day because uh, it was warm. And so uh, that air conditioning, I'm sure, would would, uh, would definitely help in a lot of those initiatives. So uh, look forward to seeing that uh, 
grow as uh, as time goes on. So good luck with the uh, with the plans for that. Uh, we've got about three minutes left here, uh, and we could go on for hours. Uh, but Joe, uh, there, there's some educational outreach. Can you can you give give us a real quick uh, rundown on that? Sure, Neil. We had an opportunity uh, with a local organization who was setting up something called Pi Day. Imagine that, uh, 3.14, March 14th, or the closest Friday. And uh, they asked us if we would participate. And uh, the club got together and put together a pretty stellar demonstration um, where we talk about magnetics and electricity and the the magic that happens between them and um, how that ultimately turns into a radio wave. So we've uh, participated in several events, thousands of uh, students in the uh, fourth, fifth, sixth grade. And our goal is to use the, uh, the expertise in the club to, to reach out to the next generation and, and hopefully get them interested in STEM careers. Well, absolutely. And that's a lot what I do. So that's uh, near and dear to my heart. And I, I was able to see a uh, a little bit of a uh, demonstration set up uh, there when I walked in. Um, I didn't get a chance to, to look at it real well, but uh, there had been some some kind of a d- display earlier and demonstration um, earlier that day, and uh, it's awesome the things you're doing, so that's just great. Now, uh, I've, I've got one minute left, and I'm not sure who to, to direct this to, but uh, in our meeting the other day, uh, I know the Drake fans out there uh, Drake was uh, just up the road in Miamisburg. Uh, I understand we've got a complete collection or near complete collection of Drake equipment up there. Uh, yes, this is Jay and um, Bob Drake, uh, who was the founder of RL Drake, was uh, very good about putting one of everything that they built aside and, uh, you know, stored it in, in McGee's closet, so to speak. Um, and when Bob passed away, uh, much of that was discovered. And uh, when they relocated the business to Franklin, Ohio, uh, the employees put together a museum uh, essentially in the lobby, a, a behind glass type uh, display, um, beginning with stuff that he built during World War II. And, of course, the, uh, uh, the early phone patch and the filters, TBI filters, uh, the high high-pass and low-pass filters, then the Drake 1A and, of course, the 2A, 2B, et cetera. Um, when R.L. Drake was purchased uh, by uh, one of by Bondertongue, one of the cable TV companies, the collection was going to go into storage. So we contacted the, the president of Blondertongue and persuaded them to donate the collection to the gray uh, portion of our museum. And uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, this equipment. It is in pristine condition. Many pieces have never even uh, been um, operated in in, uh, service other than when they were on the the, the bench being uh, uh, aligned. Um, So we've got everything beginning with, the, as I said, the World War II products all the way through the the TR-7 and R-8 uh, era of R.L. Drake. Uh, And uh, it's... Quite an addition. That's excellent. So all you Drake fans, make sure you stop by this place and and check this stuff out. Again, voamuseum.org is the website, and the uh, and the club station, wch8voa.org. Uh, check those out. And, and guys, thanks uh, for being here. Um, and that's going to be a wrap for this week's edition of Ham Talk Live. I'd like to thank my guests, Gary West, K8DEV, Jay Aldrich, K8CJY, and Joe Gruber, WD8AZQ, and all the callers and listeners out there in cyberspace, and invite you all back next Thursday night at 9 p.m. Eastern when my guest will be Rosalie White, K1STO, who is the coordinator of the ARIS program at ARRL. They recently celebrated their 1,000th QSO with the International Space Station, and Rosalie will be here to reflect on the program and fill us in on the future of ARIS. So, with... Assistant producer Nick Bauer, KC9GZY. This is Neil Rapp, WB9VPG, saying 7375, and may the good DX be yours.